Hey, good morning. I'm Michael Laycock. For those of you that uh, don't know who I am, I'm our lead pastor. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask you to help me welcome Scott Boyd to the stage. Thank you. Scott has been uh, leading and facilitating our men's ministry for several years and uh, is now kind of stepping into a director of what we would call Grace Ministries, which is not like a whole new department, but it is a space of influencing all of our ministries to make sure that grace is actually touching our realities. It's not just a theological thought. Um, so anyway, I'm super excited to have Scott with me this morning. Thanks, me too. Um, so hey, let's, uh, let's do our normal. Turn to your neighbor. Turn to your neighbor, make sure, and say, we are better together. Find another neighbor and say, I am your companion, not your competitor. All right, uh, then last, look across the room, find somebody in another section, make eye contact, make sure you know who you're talking to. I will choose to connect and not compare. All right, great. Hey, uh, so we're, we're excited to be in this Better Together series uh, where we're looking at partnerships in the scriptures and then bringing our stories uh, to us as a community. Uh, so part of the story uh, actually uh, is, is this piece that when this series got put together, it was all partners. And I panicked. Uh, this was like two months ago because I'm under this, this idea or the pressure of being the lead pastor and the lead teaching pastor. And I thought, I should probably teach one or two of these by myself. And I don't know if the church is ready for us just to go to team teaching. But then the Lord sovereignly gets me sick uh, and I lose my voice the week I'm supposed to, to open the series. Uh, and so then we had Beth and Steve, Beth and Steve and Mark and Cody last week. Uh, and then I was up to be on my own this week. And uh, I was like, this is going to be like, I'm the only guy that won't work with anybody. Uh, so we, I called Scott, my good friend. I was like, Scott, let's do this together. So I'm super, super excited to have Scott uh, with me this morning. Thank you. So my name is Scott Boyd. Um, and I've been attending this church since 1981. I was 20 years old when my late wife, Bev, and I began to attend. We were married in this church. We raised our kids here found a relationship with God, and we found lifelong friends. Early on in our journey, I felt God call me to be in the marketplace and make the most that I could with my engineering degree while staying at Christian Fellowship. That was the call. And initially, it was a difficult slog. I had turned down two job offers in other states that would have taken me from here, and it was nine months before I found my first engineering job. I painted, cleaned bathrooms, did all kinds of stuff through that period of time, and prayed a lot, by the way. And after two different career moves, I uh, ended up buying into an engineering business in town and then followed that by starting a commercial plumbing and mechanical contracting business in 1996 that's called Quest Tech Mechanical. I felt a call to endure in this place with these people for a long time. This may be been one of the most consistent directions from God in my life. It's not always been easy, sticking with the church over 40 years, nor has my journey been all that easy either. I've had th I have three sons. They're like 38, 35, and 32 now. I was married to Bev, my late wife, for 38 years. She passed from stage three pancreatic cancer in 2020. Then in 2021, I married again to an amazing woman, Eileen Marie Boyd, that I believe God brought into my life. Eileen had lost her husband, Jeff, after 30 years of marriage to cancer too. She had a similar faith journey to mine. She has two awesome kids, now 27 and 29. The oldest just got married last month to a really great young man named Aaron. We met on eHarmony. I'm a little embarrassed by that. <laughs> but I found in Eileen everything God had put on my heart for a new wife. I've been blessed and I've experienced God redeem my darkest days. He, God, is a redeemer. So today, we're going to talk about faithful companions. 
faithful companions have enduring relationships of trust that benefit their communities. And at the end of the message, Mike and I are going to ask you if there are faithful companions in your life that will benefit the places that you have influence, including this place. You see, God only gives us gifts to give to others. And as we give our gifts to others, we're blessed. So Mike has been a faithful companion in my life. I'm supposed to keep going right here? Okay. Had a moment of doubt. In 1998, Mike started to work for me at Quest Tech. And he and I developed our company's estimating process. Mike was talented with technology. He had great organizational skills. He was a hard worker. He would have had an amazing career in the construction industry had he stayed. Many of his contributions to our systems still exist in the company today, and I'm blessed to have had him with me for a time. But I knew he felt called, and I could see his heart for the church. And when he left to begin serving at the church, we transitioned to friends. I knew Mike had the capacity and the heart to become a leader. Over the next years, Mike and I would get together to share what God was revealing to one another. Mike initially was finding things out about the contemplative practices of these guys called the Desert Fathers. And I was discovering grace as a close friend of mine, Bruce Moe and I, studied Galatians for a couple of years. Mike still worked for me part-time after he went to work at the church, but I'd often grab him and bring him into my office to talk about God. He'd feel guilty because he was on the clock. (laughs) But I didn't care because our conversations would ignite my faith, and I loved them. Fifteen years passed, and Mike and I connected when we could, hanging out when we could, continuing our friendship. Then, in 2017, I got this wild idea of doing a John Townsend year-long leadership program. The closest one I could find was in Louisville, Kentucky, where I actually had opened an office. And Mike agreed to join with me. And so we got to spend uh, six hours driving there and six hours hours driving home once a month. And then we did this all-day-long leadership conference that a friend of mine, Jeff Moe, called an emotional colonoscopy. (laughs) Together, we processed what we were learning and experiencing in the leadership conference. We listened to books in the car together. We talked about what we were hearing. We listened to each other's phone calls. We talked about our respective lives, and our friendship grew closer. I learned how hard it was to be a pastor listening to the problems Mike would encounter. Mike would comment on how open and vulnerable I was with my friends and associates. We found common ground in our journeys, and I found in Mike's heart a humility and dream to create a community where people could be known and loved. I found Mike had a growing ability to hold space for the difficult emotions I was processing. He had become a faithful companion to me. The beginning of uh, our uh, friendship uh, was when I was an employee at Quest Tech nearly 23 years ago. I knew nothing except some technology. I knew how to use a computer. Um, and, and so Scott was teaching me how to understand drawings and construction and all of that. And we used to set hours across the table from one another, usually some worship music in the back. And then occasionally we would drift into conversations about God and faith. And, uh, and a friendship was beginning to bud. But one of the things that was so amazing about Scott is that he had an excitement for me, even though I was going to probably leave Quest Tech. Um, but he was able to affirm to me uh, that which was in my heart. And I remember driving to, we were driving for an hour, hour and a half to a job site to look at this construction project that we were going to do an estimate on. And I was wrestling through all of the ideas of leaving uh, a job in the construction industry where I felt like my salary was secure uh, and I had a future. And then, but I had this yearning to go to the church and to, to be here. And Scott, I remember just driving along. I was driving. He was right here. I can remember it like it was yesterday. And he just says, you have something to offer. 
And it's amazing when a friendship moves to that place where they see something and can call it out in you. It's not about just confrontation. It's about the place where God actually speaks something to you uh, that you hope is in your heart. But when somebody from the outside says it, it's powerful. So this morning, we're going to take a, take a moment or two and just kind of talk about Moses and Aaron, actually. Um, we're going to share the story of Moses uh, and Aaron and, and their delivering of the people of Israel. Uh, but Moses and Aaron are the first partnership or brothers, actually, in the scriptures that actually went well, for their, and, and they actually did something of benefit for their community. I mean, if you think about Adam and Eve, that's not so good. You think about Cain and Abel, that didn't end out so good. Tower of Babel, not so good. But, uh, but Moses and Aaron do something amazing together, uh, because not only were they actual brothers, they really bear out what it looks like to be faithful companions. And so the first part of Moses' journey is actually in the book of Exodus. Uh, and if you want to, you can mark down Exodus, read the whole book, and then go to Numbers, and you can find some more of the story. And then if you go to Acts chapter 7, you'll actually see where Stephen is speaking to people, and he actually gives a summary of what happened with Moses and Aaron. Um, and so what we'd like to do is just briefly tell the story. And so Moses is actually born into a time when the people of Israel are literally in captivity they're in bondage, they're in slavery. And God has said, be fruitful and multiply in this place. And so they actually are. The, the, the Hebrew people are actually becoming very fruitful. And the Pharaoh who is over them is now worried that they're going to become too numerous and overtake Egypt. So he, he, makes a, a, he, he gives an edict, which is, hey, all the Egyptian midwives, you need to throw the babies that are male in the Nile and let them die. And so Moses is born into a season when actually all male children that are Hebrew are supposed to be killed. And so what happens with Moses is actually he's, he's put in a basket in the river at the time he was supposed to be thrown into the river to die, and Pharaoh's daughter finds him and then raises him. So Moses is actually given more of an Egyptian uh, culture as he was being raised by Pharaoh's daughter. And in the middle of that, Somewhere around the age of 40, he actually notices his people. So here the Hebrew people have been in bondage for these 40 years that Moses' life has been going on. And at 40, he has eyes to see and he's angered and he carries a burden for his people. And then he sees an Egyptian man uh, beating a Hebrew. And so Moses then kills this Egyptian man. Yeah, so then we... Uh pick up Acts 27 to 30. So Moses killed this guy, and I think he thought he got away with it. But maybe nobody, the only people that saw it were the Israelis, the Israelites, and um, they would protect him. And so he sees a couple of uh, uh, Israel brothers that are arguing, and he tries to step in to resolve their argument. That's where we're at in Acts 7:27. These brothers go, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? And at this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now, when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. So here we find this time where Moses had fled into the wilderness and 40 years went by. He knew he was from Israel. I think we can assume that he knew Aaron was his brother. He'd figured that out. What can we draw from these 40 years? Well, one thing is, is Moses endured in his friendship with Aaron, his brother. He might have felt like a failure. Certainly he was an exile. He stayed away from where the rest of the Israelites were, but someone who might have been afraid about what might be known about him. It's where enduring can be pointed out. He endured this time, 40 years, stayed connected with his family. Often we have no idea what our path with God will be. Often we don't know the who in our path. Who will God connect me to? What will God's influence be in my life? What will my influence be? But we can develop a value for enduring with our friends. I have found great value from friendships. Often, 
Some of those friendships went through times in the desert. Do you have those friends where you're experiencing the desert time of sort? So coming out of 40 years in the desert, we have the, the picture of Moses noticing a burning bush that's now being consumed by the fire, and, and Moses is then spoken to by the Lord. This burden that he got 40 years ago for his people, uh, God now brings him to a space to say, now you're ready. Um, that was 80. So if you do 40 plus 40, that's 80. Moses is now ready at 80 for the Lord to say, now I want you to go and deliver my people. And Moses is insecure in this place. And he actually is like, I don't think I can do that, even though it is resonating with him to be the, the deliverer. And he says, well, you have a brother. His name is Aaron, and he can speak well. And so I'm going to add Aaron to you. And so we find this place that in the deliverance of the people of God, God partners these two brothers together, and they become companions in this journey. And so often we don't think about the fact that when we are asked to do something, our insecurities will flare up and we'll actually say, I'm not going to do this. Um, but if God would just give us one person beside us, all of a sudden we are able to do it. I remember when we were in the middle of this project and, and getting ready to build this, we'd just gotten the estimates back, and it was an amazing bid that came back, like $3 million more than we were supposed to do. And uh, I was like, oh, this is it. Uh, I guess we're just going to have to keep fundraising for another two or three years, and hopefully um, God will be faithful and we'll, we'll actually see this happen. And Another faithful companion of mine is actually David Boyd, Scott's son. Now, I have been able to live between these two generations, and it has been amazing to have faithful companions in both of them. But David happened to call me on the day that I was considering pulling the plug and going, I think we have to like, keep fundraising. We can't do this. And he said, Mike, we can do this. He said, we can, keep, we can keep working with the architects. We can come up with a design. We can change things around, and we will be able to do this. Now's the time. And I found it an amazing thing to have someone speak faith into me, and that's what faithful companions do. And so that's why we have to receive those that God brings into our lives, because he's going to call you to do something, and you're going to need somebody to go alongside. So we pick up the story of Aaron and Moses in Exodus 17, 8 to 13. I'm going to read some of it. The Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. So they took a stone and they put it under him, and on it he sat, he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun, and Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. So a couple things to draw out of this passage. So Moses is somewhere between 80 and 120, you know? Let's just guess 100. He's 100 years old right now. But we find Moses and Aaron together again. They've stayed together, faithful companions for the benefit of Israel. Two, faithful companions holding up your arms. There's a principle here of friends helping one another in difficult times. And three, Aaron and Hur helping Moses, might be in his hundreds, helping an aged Moses to continue to have influence. This made me think of the heritage that we've received from Phil, Dan, Clay, and Scott, who have all just recently retired. The, the influence they have given to us out of their enduring with one another, honoring one another, and keeping the faith in their calling together. Might we find a calling to keep their influence alive in this house, to hold up the arms of their influence on this place called Christian Fellowship, and to also value enduring with companions? Yeah, so as we think about faithful companions who endure, enter into enduring relationships of trust, 
to benefit their communities. We're going to give you like four principles this morning that we've drawn up out of these stories. And this just gives us a little handhold, maybe a picture of what a faithful companion might look like in your life. And so the first one is faithful companions are built from relationships of trust where you take risks to go deeper. So don't look across the room and go, I've seen that person. I think that should be my faithful companion. And you've never actually talked to them. That's not the faithful companion you should choose. You should take some relationship that already exists, somebody who you already have begun to build trust with, and say, is there a way for us to go slightly deeper? When Scott invited me to the Townsend Leadership uh, Year, that was once a month, 12 hours in a car, an eight-hour day. Um, and it was an amazing adventure, but I had to say yes. So Scott took a risk and said, Mike, you want to do this with me? And I said yes, and I had no idea how that would transform our friendship. And let me just tell you, after 12 hours in the car once a month for a year with Scott Boyd, you will change. Uh, I know. Um, it's really important to know that. But we actually changed each other. Yeah. We actually found that now we're in nearly 25 years of friendship. And we've walked through deep waters, and we have found that as we... Every time there's an opportunity to go a little deeper with each other, we take the risk and we found a faithfulness come uh, that we could not have imagined 25 years ago. Honestly, Mike and I have nothing hidden. It's amazing to have relationships like that where he knows everything about me, he knows all my skeletons, yep. and I think I know his as well. Yep. And uh, it gives us a place to, uh, to speak into each other's lives to help, help us help one another see things. So faithful companions are also in the background of each other's stories. They share in each other's destinies, but not necessarily their vocation. So Mike and I found ourselves in interesting times over these last few years. You see, Mike and Phil, and myself and my oldest son, David, were involved in the building project together. We were involved in an advisory committee together. But there was another story that was going on. It was the story of Mike succeeding Phil and the story of David succeeding me. We've seen the succession of Mike taking the lead role, uh, pastor role from Phil before us. But at the same time, as I was taking care of my late wife as she was dying from her cancer, COVID hit, David was taking over the role of president of Questec Mechanical from me. Mike and Phil and David and I found each other in similar stories. We were in the background of those stories, particularly with me and Mike, Mike and David, Phil and David, Phil and me. But I would never have expected that we would find such common ground, but all of us had conversations about the journey along the way. You find common experiences, common emotions, common strategies that benefit the stage of life that you're in right now. I had these same type of experiences with Bruce Moe. I became the leader of my company in similar time frame as Bruce becoming the head of his organization. We had different experiences. Bruce was in not-for-profit. I was in a, a construction company that I owned, for-profit. But in the background of our stories, we helped each other become stronger with greater wisdom to meet the challenges that come with those journeys. There is such a value in enduring relationships because you never know when the journeys will provide common experiences that will benefit the sphere of influence in your company. So the word enduring is, is one of the words I want you guys to remember. Mike? Yeah, so faithful companions, the third principle is that they're better together than on their own. So if you rehearse the story of Moses and Aaron and you guys get a chance to read that in Exodus, you'll find that Moses murders an Egyptian on his own. But if you keep reading, you'll find that Aaron, when Moses was on the mountaintop receiving the Ten Commandments, the instructions from the Lord, Aaron actually crafts an idol. He builds a golden calf for the people to worship. And so you find Moses killing somebody, Aaron creating an idol. And when Moses comes down from the, the mountain, I love this part, it's, it's hilarious to me, uh, because Moses says, Aaron, what did you do? And he says, I don't know. I threw the gold in and a calf came out. And you're like... <laughs> But the scriptures say Aaron fashioned a calf. So Aaron actually did it. Uh, and so there's this place where you find each of these guys are not perfect. They actually do more together 
better. Because when they're on their own, their weaknesses grab a hold of them. And so if you've ever been in a conversation with Scott, you probably have seen uh, this picture drawn. Uh, and so I want to share it with you, but it's a, it's, a, it's a picture about perspective. So I've probably heard this or seen this a hundred times, because that's how often Scott and I have hung out. Um, but if you are the blue dot, that is all that you can see in front of you, just this perspective. If you're the yellow dot, you have a perspective. The green diamond in the middle is what we share in common. We can both see that. But I can't see what he sees, and he can't see what I see. And so what happens is you actually have a better perspective. So sometimes when I'm lost in what I think has to happen, and I'm talking to Scott, he'll be like, but there's another perspective, Mike. And he shows me what's in my blind spot. And he helps me to not make a decision that's limited to my perspective. And when you have faithful companions, they begin to step into your life and they begin to speak to you so that your emotions of what you see and how you react to that don't take over. And they actually keep you from just doing crazy, silly things like murdering people or like creating calves to worship. That's good. That's good. So faithful companions also endure hard seasons and difficult situations together. And I have two stories, uh, two cancer stories, and a third story of God's redemption to try to share. In my first cancer story, Bev was diagnosed with breast cancer, and we did the whole cancer gig in 2003. Chemo, losing your hair, all that kind of stuff. Now, Bev made it through and recovered. But in that journey, I wanted to be your hero, and I wanted to do it well, but I was anything but. I was afraid. I was depressed. I was missing commitments at my work and simply trying to escape when I came home. I was failing in a battle with pornography in my escaping, and I hated myself. I would go on walks, and my prayer would be, God, I pray that you'd bless me because of your grace, because of what Jesus did, because if it's dependent upon me, well, I'm doomed. I approached Bruce Moe in the same time frame, and I asked him, I said, could we be more intentional in our friendship? Bruce and I started meeting downtown in a basement coffee shop called The Artisan with leather chairs. We would meet on Friday mornings at 6 a.m. It's a practice we continue to this day almost 20 years later. It took me months to tell Bruce my whole story, the things I was ashamed about, the things I was hiding. But in that place, Bruce and I began to grow. Bruce reciprocated. We became more and more close. And then one day we decided to do a crazy thing. Let's memorize the book of Galatians. <laughs> Easy to say, but hard to do. Um, took us about a year and a half, but we actually did it. And, it. and from the platform, we actually recited Galatians. I did chapters one through three, and Bruce did four through six. And it changed our lives. We discovered grace like we'd never understood it before. And in some ways, it's changed the tra trajectory of this church as well. My second story is when Bev was diagnosed with stage three pancreatic cancer, 16 years later. Her diagnosis was essentially a death sentence. We were turned down as a candidate to go to Mayo. WashU told us they'd never been able to successfully treat what Bev had. The journey was different. Bev and I were intentional about trusting God and trusting what we found in our hearts. We walked in the light with each other, telling each other whatever we were experiencing. There was no doing. It was just, we just met and trusted what God brought. And so if I was afraid, I would tell Bev I was afraid. If Bev was angry, she'd tell me she was angry. If I was thinking about what am I going to do after she died, we'd talk about that. We walked in the light with each other. We held hope that she might be healed because we found we couldn't go forward without hope. And we held the tension of having that hope while talking about her dying. 
We were cared for by so many who were with us on that journey. My one friend, Bruce Moe, had turned into many. Her chemo treatments were four to five hours every two to three weeks. But we never sat in the infusion clinic alone, at least until COVID messed that up. It was a horrible time, but it was a time that I'll always treasure because I got to say goodbye to my wife of 38 years, my best friend. The third leg of my story is about my journey through grief. The quiet in my house was deafening. I could go home for a weekend and not speak to anyone. Well, speaking is like my major hobby. It's really hard for me to not do that. <laughs> and so um, I got to find my place. Um, oh, yeah, Bruce and Pam, they started to have me over for breakfast every Saturday morning. And uh, we would cry together, telling stories about Bev. I think we did that for 12 weeks. Then Mike went with me to a men's retreat in Atlanta with the new president of True Face, another 12-hour drive that we took together. We ended up in this beautiful setting in the pine forest of northern Georgia. Mike and I each were staying in our respective tiny homes. They've developed this place with these tiny homes all along this trail, and there was a stream in the woods. We were going back to our homes for some prayer time in the retreat, and Mike commented that he was going to call Jill to tell her about how beautiful this place was. I immediately thought I'd do the same. The grief is like waves, and sometimes you catch a big one, an unexpected wave, and this was one of those times because I was going to call Bev, but she was dead, and I started to sob uncontrollably. Bubble snot, tear crying. I don't know if you've heard that expression. And Mike had a cup of coffee in one hand. With the other hand, he moved in to, to, to comfort me, and I'm sobbing. And in my sobbing, I realized my snot was dripping into his coffee. <laughs> <laughs> as bad as my sobbing was, now I was laughing so hard that it hurt, and I couldn't tell Mike what was going on. Finally, finally got it out to keep him from drinking. Yeah, so if you're going to be a faithful companion, be sure to talk about the snot in the coffee. But through that time, I was surrounded with friends, companions. And when I could not escape the thought of, I need to start looking for a wife in a time, too so in a time frame too soon for some, I walked into the light. I told Mike, I told Bruce, I told Phil, and then the hardest person of all. I told Pam Moe, who was Bev's best friend. I kept them up to date on the connections I was making, the online dating scene, the interviews. But then in, in eHarmony, this lady named Eileen, with an A, reached out. And we quickly found that we had both lost spouses to cancer. We both loved being married. We both loved God. Eileen had been the teacher of the year twice. She actually wanted to move from California to the Midwest. It was crazy. I didn't believe her for a long time. <laughs> but she would be a good Grammy to my grandchildren. And Phil... Bruce, Mike, and Pam all got to hear about this new friend that I was texting daily. Long story short, seven months later we were married. I did not know that God could redeem my darkness. I did not know that God would be with me through my friends and my grieving. But he has. He's a good God. You can trust him and we can trust others. I have this new woman in my life now with different strengths. She has me in hers. But what we're finding is that we have this new mirror to see ourselves. And we're growing because we're finding out different things about ourselves in this season. I've discovered a new faithful companion in Eileen. And, um, and I love what God's done. So Scott and I have been preparing together for this morning. We rehearsed a list uh, the other day of each of us had at least somewhere between 15 and 20 people we would call faithful companions in our lives. And that, that came because we've been working at developing relationships of trust for a long time. 
Yeah, it, it, doesn't, start, it starts with one. Yeah. It starts with one person. It just starts with one. And so as we consider faithful companions, these principles, they're not things that are like a formula. They're just a practice. But ultimately, a faithful companion is somebody who finally knows everything there is to know about your story. And they decide to stay. They decide there's nothing that you've shared that's too scary for them. And they're just going to be there. So you get to share dreams, you get to share your fears, all of that. Yeah. And we would like to invite you to have an opportunity to come forward. Just as a way to say, you know, God, I, I want to see this in my life. And I, I'm going to walk forward to take that risk so that you can help me take a risk with one of my friends to go deeper. And ask God to help me, to help me develop this faithful companion. So the question this morning is, is there a relationship of trust that you can go deeper in, that you can aspire to become a faithful companion to? So you invite, or let somebody else invite you, and you respond.